Peter was born Simon, son of Barjona in Bethesda, which is in Galilee, which is, which is near, um, which is actually is present-day Israel. Peter's uh, brother was the apostle Andrew, and a friend of theirs also was Philip, who was another apostle. Peter was a very simple fisherman by trade. He was married, had a wife. In fact, his mother-in-law also lived with him. It's interesting, the first time that Peter met Christ, that he and several of the other apostles were fishing. Jesus saw Peter fishing, and when Peter had brought the, the nets in and there were no fish, Jesus instructed Peter to throw the nets on this side. Peter, being um, a realist, understanding the difficulties of the sea, kind of chuckled at the fact that Jesus told him to once again go out and cast your nets, but this time on the other side of the boat. Um, Peter refused to even try. It's interesting that the first time Peter meets or encounters Christ, that the issue of faith is at the forefront. And Jesus, uh, encouraging him, convinced him to set out his boats again. And uh, at the time of casting down the nets, uh, began to fill the boat with so many fish that the boats even began to sink. Peter understood at this moment in his life that there was something very special going on. There was something that would never that, that his life would never be the same, that he would indeed be a fisherman extraordinaire from that point on. And Jesus changes Peter's name to Cephas, who in Greek, in Greek is translated the rock. One of the reasons why Christ changed the name of Saul to Paul and Cephas to Peter was because when one takes up their cross and follows Christ and commits their life to him, you essentially have a new birth into Christ and you take on a new name. Just as in the tradition of baptism, we are given the name of a saint, somebody to guide us through our lives, and so we have something to look forward and to look up to and to be our guide. You have to remember that Peter left his wife and his children and his mother and his father, even though his brother came with him and some of his friends came with him, the fishermen. Uh, he indeed left everything that he knew as normal, as realistic, as um, commonplace to follow this mission. Well, that's something as our military today, when they leave and they go to foreign lands to defend our country, it is a very, very painful experience. They're human, that doesn't cease, but there is something greater which comes over and fulfills that which is lacking, and that is the grace and the love of God. So when one says, pick up your cross and follow me, I believe what Peter did was the epitome of picking up your cross and following Christ. The relationship of Peter and Christ is a very, very close relationship. Well, I don't think Christ loved him any more than he did the other apostles. The way it was explained to me, and I think we can look at it, is it was a different kind of love that he had for Peter as the other apostles. Just as a father, he has a different kind of love for each of his sons or daughters. I think that was the same with Christ. He loved them all, but he loved them all in a different, unique way from, all the, from the talents that they had. I think one of the reasons why there was so much closeness with Peter and Christ is because Peter was one of the first ones that was called as a disciple to Christ. During his earthly ministry, during the, those crucial years at the end of Christ's life, uh, Peter saw Christ uh, perform many miracles. They saw people healed. They saw him teach multitudes. They saw him feed 5,000 people with a couple of fish, three fish and five loaves of bread. In one instance when there was a possessed individual, a sick and an infirmed individual, and the apostles tried to cure this individual, and Christ said, you can't do this. This only comes out through prayer and fasting. So it was, he had to teach them how to do. It was through prayer and fasting that infirmed individual was restored back to health. When Peter saw these miracles performed by Jesus, he, he, he must have been astounded. I mean, making blind people see and making, uh, raising the dead. This is not a simple band-aid or a salve. This is a profound healing experience. One of the more memorable moments in Peter's life was when Christ came to him, walk, came to the apostles in the boat walking on water and they were very afraid because they thought there was some kind of a ghost or phantasm. And then Peter realized who he was and he started to walk out and he walked on water until his lack of faith and fear entered into him, which was an irrational fear. And he started to sink and Christ grabbed him 
and, 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 and instructed him that his faith had to be strong. When I think of St. Peter, I think of somebody who is very, very impetuous, anxious, um, driven. He wants to touch and feel and see for himself, and yet he has his doubts. Over and over again, we see that he needs reinforcement. The miracles proved by Jan the Shadow of Doubt that this man was the Christ. He was the son of the living God because he could perform miracles. In a way, they helped Peter's faith. Just like we do have miracles today. We do have crying icons. We have miraculous healings, which are the same miracles. But why don't people believe today they're miracles as opposed to Christ raising someone from the dead? Both of them are the same miracles. And the difference is faith. And that's what Peter had. And we as Orthodox Christians, we aspire to have that same faith. They saw miracles. And yet, they were never challenged themselves until one day Jesus asked Peter, who do you think I am? And some of the apostles said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, some say you're the Jeremiah, some say you're the prophets, or some say you're Elijah. And Christ looks at him and he says, okay, but what do you, who do you say I am? And all the apostles, I would imagine, kind of look puzzled at one another. And Peter was the one that came out and said, Confidently, he said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The significance of that is because Jesus was often seen as a miracle worker, as a great teacher, as a great prophet. But without the recognition that he was the Messiah, all of that would have been futile. And at that point, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And upon that confession, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. What's interesting about Peter is that he was a poor fisherman, a lowly person, and Christ chose him to be one of his leaders, one of the foremost of the apostles to establish his church upon the confession of faith, confession of faith that Peter made saying that you are the son of God. That's why he changed his name from Simon to Peter, Petros, because he even told him, upon this rock I will build my church. And why did he say that? because of the confession of faith that Peter made. And from that point on, as tradition has it, uh, Peter led the way to the proselytizing the entire world uh, from the time Christ left the earth till the time of his crucifixion and execution. Peter was an incredible spokesman, an incredible um, missionary for the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people believe and I, believe, I think they're wrong when they believe it, is they think that Christ gave Peter and only Peter the keys of the kingdom. The keys associated with Peter I mean, since he was the first, the leader of the apostles, a first among equals, as it were, that he was uh, given the keys of the kingdom of heaven by his confession. But if you read the text once again, Peter, Christ gives Peter the keys of the kingdom because of his confession of faith that he says, Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So therefore, he gives it to all the apostles because the apostles believe it. And he also gives it to all of us who believe and confess that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He gives all of us the keys to the kingdom, the power to get to the kingdom. One of the most important events in the life of St. Peter along with Christ and their relationship is the time that Christ was going to Jerusalem for the last week that he was going to be alive on the earth before his crucifixion, that uh, in the evening Peter had gone up to Christ and told them that you cannot go to Jerusalem. We have to keep you from going there because, you know, they're going to kill you. So we have to protect you. We're going to take you somewhere else. And Christ turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Having us understand scripturally that evil works on us constantly and that the battle, the good fight, as St. Paul would say, um, is constant. It never lets up, even in the holiest of circles. Many times we believe that the devil works overtime in the church and in holy circles because God has more to gain there, so the devil has more to gain also. It must be a very difficult moment for Peter because probably Peter thought he was doing the right thing because he goes, I have to protect my master. And 
all of a sudden you hear Christ saying to him, you're Satan, get away from me. And he just probably was dumbfounded saying, you know what, what did I do wrong? He may have asked himself, what did I do, what did I do wrong? What, what was wrong here? I'm trying to save him. Not realizing that Christ had to go to Jerusalem. Prior to the betrayal and the um, arrest of Jesus, Jesus has one last confrontation face to face with Peter. He tells Peter that he's going to betray him. Peter will betray him three times before the cock crows. And Peter saying, I would never do this. I love you. I could never do this to somebody I love so much, who I have followed, who I gave up family and children and, and riches and everything that the world could offer. How could I do that? And Peter doesn't believe him. He says, no, I'm not. But actually when Christ is, when Christ is arrested, um, they come around and they ask Peter, do you know this man Christ? He was asked if he was one of them because he sounded to the jailers and to the country peasants that were helping in the jails that his voice, his, his accent was different, the gospel says. Your, your, your voice betrays you, that you also were one of them, one of the Galileans one of the followers of, of, of this person, Jesus. And Peter just saw what happened to Christ, that he was incarcerated, that he's going to probably be led to death. So Peter denies him. Well, when the rooster crowed three times, and at the, after the third time, Peter was absolutely devastated because it was the person that he loved, that he, that he defended, that he accompanied with, that he learned from at his very feet, and Peter understood at that moment what Jesus meant. That the temptation will come at any time. The opportunity to turn your life away from Christ will come at any time. It's a message to all of us throughout the ages. And Peter responded in a very profound way. In understanding his wrong, he wept bitterly. Weeping is a catharsis. He cleaned his soul of that sin at that moment by weeping and by understanding what his soul must now encounter in being true to the faith of this, the Savior, Jesus Christ. There will be tumult. There will be temptation that he will fall to. But if you understand it and you are able to defeat Satan, even after falling, you can again stand up straight, spiritually straight, and continue your path towards salvation. We could ask ourselves, after seeing for himself, walking with Jesus and seeing the miracles, how he could so often fall back and question and deny what was going on. He was a human being like all of us. And maybe that's by design also so that we can understand our own doubts and overcome them. Some people might wonder, what is the difference between Peter's denial of Jesus and Judas's betrayal of Jesus? The difference between Judas and Peter is Again, they both separate themselves from God, but Peter went the extra mile to confess. There is a big difference between uh, Peter, Peter's denial of Jesus and Judas's betrayal of Jesus. When Peter denies, when Peter's faith wavers, he is indicating that he's losing faith in himself. He's losing faith for Christ by himself and in and of himself. When Judas betrays Jesus Christ, he is not only showing a lack of faith, he is literally selling Jesus Christ. So he's not just lacking faith and struggling with his faith, he's going one step forward and further by selling Jesus Christ. Peter doubts, Judas sells. The difference between Judas's denial of Christ and Peter's denial of Christ, both sin, both negative, both wrong, was that Judas, in the pain which he felt about what he did to Jesus Christ, because they were friends, this, he followed Christ, he saw all these miracles, he went out and sinned again by hanging himself, a sin that can never be forgiven because there's no chance for repentance. Peter, on the other hand, repented inward and repented to God and then later through his actions and through his example and through his teaching and through being that rock and that person that Jesus wanted him to. When Christ died, the apostles lived as fugitives. They were sought to be killed and they hid. After the resurrection, Christ appears to Peter and almost badgers him about undoing or reconciling his threefold denial before the resurrection. Christ comes and says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Agapazme, 
feed my sheep. He says this to him twice. The third time he says, Peter, do you love me? But Philisme, do you embrace me? Do you cling to me? Will you adhere to me at all times? Feed my lamb. And Peter said, you know, I love you, Lord. And then he knew in his heart that this was what he was referring to, that he forgave him. Then be a shepherd to my sheep. You are forgiven, in effect. It's interesting because the three times that um, that Peter tells Christ that he loves him, it actually uh, reaffirms the love that he has for Christ as opposed to the time when he denied him the three times. After Pentecost, at some point, the apostles drew lots because they felt that they were obligated to go and spread the gospel. And it fell to Peter also to leave Jerusalem and to spread the gospel into the area of the Balkans. And so he also accepted his responsibility as the others did to go out and to be missionaries. Peter also too traveled extensively in all parts of the world at the time preaching the world, word of God. He traveled from Asia Minor to Antioch to, uh, to even parts of the Middle East. In fact, um, Peter started the first Christian church in Antioch. In Peter's ministry, he preached predominantly to the Jewish people. And each place Peter went, he consecrated a bishop, leaving them a shepherd, leaving them somebody to watch over them, not just passing by, giving people some words and then leaving, but leaving them a shepherd, somebody to look up to and somebody to continue to help their relationship grow with Christ. At one point, there was great controversy between Peter and Paul. Peter felt that Christianity should be brought only to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul chastised Peter because Peter refused to sit and eat unclean meat with Gentiles individuals that Paul was trying to convert and bring them into the Christian faith. And Paul told Peter, what you're doing is wrong. We have to sit with these people and eat what they have and not be away from them. We need to bring them to the table with us to eat and to drink, to understand that we are people like they are and that we're bringing a great message of great joy to them. One day, Peter had a vision, as is described in the book of Acts, when he was hungry and he saw a large sheet descend from heaven with all of the animals on it. And the voice told Peter, eat. Well, there were some animals there that were considered by Jewish definition to be unclean. And Peter said, no, Lord, I cannot eat anything that is unclean. And the voice said to him, I have not created anything that is unclean. And this happens three times. And then Peter awakes from the trance. What this tells us is it clearly defines Peter's mission to the Gentiles in that Peter always thought the Gentiles were unclean, not worthy of hearing the word of God, and not worthy of conversion. But now God in no terms is telling Peter that the Gentiles are not unclean. They are also worthy that you should preach the gospel to them. And he came back and he accepted Paul's understanding that the gospel should go to all nations. It must have been very difficult for the apostles because they were taught by Jesus Christ. They lived with him, they saw, they experienced. And yet this person who was on the opposite end of the spectrum, who was, who was persecuting Christians at the time of Christ, all of a sudden now had leaped beyond them in the proselytizing of the faith. This is a very big moment in our church because it goes to show the humanity of what Peter and Paul were, that they were human beings and they had still struggles, strifes, disagreements, as any human being does, in which one person may think they're right or the other person may think they're right. And they come into conflict sometimes. And of course, as we see that, the beauty of it is it's resolved and rectified. In many different depictions in the church, we have Saints Peter and Paul next to each other holding depictions of maybe a church, the church that two of them helped, that they labored for, that they helped begin, helped start. But there are different depictions where we will see them cheek to cheek, embracing one another as in a term of the kiss of peace, showing affection, brotherly affection for one another. That icon shows that although 
St. Peter and Paul are two human beings that did have conflict with one another, they show that they have the maturity and humility to love and respect one another, that not to continue an argument, but to come together as Christian brothers in fellowship and to show that they no longer have animosity over one another. After his extensive travels uh, through Asia Minor, through Jerusalem and Antioch and uh, the present day West, uh, Peter found himself many times uh, jailed uh, for proselytizing Jesus Christ. And the last time he found himself jailed in Rome. The Romans were gonna crucify Peter in the manner that they crucified Christ. You believe in Jesus? Fine, you're gonna die just like who you believe in. And here comes Peter, flipping reality around. I'm not worthy to die like Jesus on the cross, but I'll die on a cross, but kill me upside down. And that's why the cross of Peter is the inverted cross, and that's how he died, crucified upside down on a cross. And when he, was, when he asked to be crucified upside down, that was the utmost humility for Peter that he realized that he could never die as his master did because he was not worthy. And it was that love that came out and, and true respect and love for Christ in the way that he died. Peter had gained a level of spirituality that few of us will ever understand or that will ever attain in our lives. He had become not only a holy man, not only a true disciple, but a saint. We celebrate St. Peter's and St. Paul's feast day on the same day because they were um, killed or uh, martyred on the same day. It's interesting that Christ chose Peter, this person who's, who's struggling, who's continually makes mistakes, but continues to pick himself up and try again, and eventually becomes this great leader and shepherd of the Church of Christ. From the first time Jesus Christ met Peter, Peter was wavering and doubting. He didn't believe that they would catch any fish by putting out the nets. Then, as excited as he was walking on the water, uh, he saw the, the, the waves and he started to doubt again. He wavered and he started to sink. And after Jesus Christ was caught and to be crucified, again, Peter wavered, he teetered, he didn't have the strong faith, he wasn't strong enough to follow Christ, uh, and he denied and doubted. Finally, when he received the grace of Pentecost, he was cemented into the positive direction. And there was never any wavering after that. St. Peter is a perfect saint for an average working individual, showing that we too, who have wavering faith, can still be that great leader of the apostles and great teacher of the church. We're not perfect. Human beings are not perfect. Christ is the only perfect being. Peter fell so that he could be the example to all of us who fall, so that none of us throughout the ages that, that experience the temptation of Satan in the issue of falling would ever falter from being able to get ourselves back up spiritually and to put ourselves back on the road toward Jesus Christ. He was the first and greatest example of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. He who will be tempted and he who will fall, but he who will stumble also will be able to arise and walk again.